Hello and welcome once again to the course Life of Christ. We are in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, several classes on that major section of Scripture. And today we're going to be talking about anger and forgiveness, uh, primarily from Matthew 5, but also jumping around a little bit within Matthew. So if you can get your Bibles, we're going to begin in Matthew 5, 38 in just a minute. But first of all, I want to talk about a principle that applies not only to this material, but also material from a lot of the sections in the Sermon on the Mount, particularly in Matthew 5. And uh, it's the idea that uh, things start in the heart and then they move out from there, the heart or the mind. I remember the story of a person in Houston one time where I worked in a certain church and uh, I would go to this person's house to have Bible studies. And, and so one day I was uh, on the couch and well, be ready to begin the study. and. Uh, I looked kind of to my back and to the back of the couch because I, I noticed some movement there and I saw some cockroaches running along the back of the couch. And so as unobtrusively as I could, I kind of leaned forward a little bit uh, and just tried to ignore them while the study went on. Well, a little bit later, it turns out uh, that, that one of the people that lived in the house uh, showed up for a Sunday school class and uh, I was asking her, you know, how this person was doing and and uh, the person said, well, I just got back from the emergency room. I said, oh, what happened? And the person said, well, I, I was sleeping. Uh, and all of a sudden I woke up and I felt something in my ear and a cockroach had crawled in. And she said, I tried to get it out, but, but I couldn't get it out. Uh, and it crawled further in and it was just driving me crazy. I could feel it moving around and I could, I could hear it as well. And and at this point, I'm just thinking, ah, oh, you know, how can you stand that? <laughs> uh, and so she went to the ER and she got it out and everything. And, and after that, it was fine. Uh, but that image of a cockroach inside your ear crawling around inside your head is an image that just, I just hate it. And I wonder if when Jesus is talking to us about our sins and he talks about how things begin in the heart and in the mind, if it's not that same kind of feeling uh, if you have something inside that it's disgusting, it's revolting, you, you can't wait to get rid of it, to get it out. I think that's the attitude that Jesus wants us to have about getting rid of sins from the very beginning. Don't let it stay there in your heart, in your mind. Don't let it fester. Don't let it take root where it can grow and develop and change. And eventually, as James 1 says, bring about death. Uh, go after it when it's just first started in your heart or in your mind. And so in the Sermon on the Mount, if we look at what Jesus says and how he focuses on the internal and the heart of the mind, we could call these things, I guess, uh, cockroaches of the mind or heart. Um, and they're the hardest ones to get rid of. Uh, there's lust cockroaches and hate or anger cockroaches. There's gossip or lying cockroaches. There's uh, materialism cockroaches. There's a lot that can get in there. And it's a constant battle to try to protect yourself and defend yourself uh, just the way that we would to prevent those from getting in our homes or in our beds or in our, our food. Uh, we want to have the same kind of vigilance about not having cockroaches in our minds. And I wonder sometimes if you had uh, maybe uh, a little homework to do, let me give you this informal homework. It's something you don't turn in, but think about it. Uh, if you select your favorite TV show or movie, and kind of go through that in your head, and instead of the filter of how interesting it is, or how funny it is, or how popular it is, if you said, okay, what if we applied the filter of uh, what would God like or not like about this show? Uh, how would the show come off? If you even made it more specific and said, if God went through that show or that movie uh, and counted the number of cockroaches there are in that from a Christian point of view, where there has to do with the hate or the lust or the swearing or whatever it is, how many cockroaches would God count there? Uh, and you go through and you think, and you might count and find, well, you know, there's probably five or six of them in there. And then God might go through and say, there's actually 12. And you say, 12, I didn't see 12. And God would point out things maybe you hadn't considered as being a damaging or dangerous for your Christian heart or mind. You know, I wonder, how many cockroaches we would tolerate in our bed or in our food? I'm pretty sure the answer is one, right? And even that would not be tolerable. Uh, you'd get rid of that. And so if you think about our, our spiritual food, 
in our spiritual residence of rest, you know, what are we, what are we going to tolerate? And I think that we find that if we're honest uh, in our entertainment, especially uh, perhaps in our, our words and our thoughts, I think you'll find that perhaps we're pretty hospitable to cockroaches of different kinds of the heart and of the mind. And I would just challenge us, first of all, to, to take an honest look at uh, what, how we think and how we entertain ourselves and see, you know, what the Lord would say about the cockroaches that are there and then begin on trying to get rid of them as well. It's difficult because sometimes uh, those entertainment cockroaches are actually kind of fun. They're entertaining. That's why it's a temptation. Uh, but I'm pretty sure the Lord would want us to try to get rid of those and find something better. And that's just a thought. And we'll come back to that with different ideas later on in other classes. So let's go to the first passage here in Matthew 5, beginning in verse 38. And since we're talking about anger or hate, uh, then let's go ahead and uh, talk about how to respond to enemies. These are parallel passages pretty much. And so we're going to stay mainly in Matthew today to read uh, the passages we'll touch. Verse 38, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, this is a, a really challenging passage, and we mentioned how radical it is in the previous class. You think about the different specifics that, that Jesus is asking us to consider about how we treat people that we don't get along with, uh, and perhaps even enemies, maybe even long-time enemies. And if you go back to the Old Testament, and you look at Leviticus um, chapter 24, let's uh, jump over to that one and read the context of, of what uh, that passage says really quickly. Chapter 24, um, beginning in verse 19, 24, 19. And it says there, anyone who injures their neighbor is to be injured in the same manner. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The one who has inflicted the injury must suffer the same injury. And so that's the context. And Jesus is saying, now you've heard that that was said. Uh, and, and that's been the law up to this point. And you think, well, you know, did God change from Leviticus over to Jesus and Matthew? And I don't think Jesus is referring back to that to say that's the ideal way to operate. I think it, back in the Old Testament, that law was put in, especially for people coming out of a pagan culture like in Egypt. Uh, that law was put in for a couple of reasons. One, uh, was to be just. If uh, you were injured in a certain way, or if you injured someone else in a certain way, then what was just for the retribution to be equal? In other words, it wouldn't be uh, extreme and as in a response, where normally if we get hit, we try to hit back even harder or twice or three times. Uh, this is put in to say, look, no more than what was done to you. And so in that sense, it was just uh, and, and also to, to limit revenge that you might take in the future, again, with the idea of being just. Um, and so that's a principle. Jesus says, now, here's the deal. You don't even have to do that. Under that law, if someone struck you or you struck someone on the other cheek, then they could strike you. Uh, or if, you know, someone struck you, you have the right to strike them back. And so Jesus is saying, you don't have to strike him back. Uh, in fact, you can give back gentleness and kindness and forgiveness instead of striking back. A totally new way of thinking that doesn't focus on the revenge or the evil. It focuses on the good and the kind of thing that Jesus wants you to do to replace the evil. 
And this whole idea of turning the other cheek uh, is also somewhat confusing. I, I mentioned before in the previous class that I've, I've talked about this passage in the prison, and the guys don't respond at all well to this because they say, look, in here, if you turn the other cheek, you're just going to get beat up all the time. You have to defend yourself. And you think about, you know, what is the real purpose of offering the cheek anyway, right? Uh, and you think that back in those cultures, one way that you greeted people was to kiss them on the cheek. We see that that was done by, you know, family members and by friends, uh, members of a, a close community. And so when you go, and, and many cultures today are the same way, and you, you kind of put your cheek against the other person's, uh, and you kind of like give an air kiss or whatever, that's a pretty standard way of greeting. And so the idea is when you're offering your cheek, the original purpose is to greet, to, to, to welcome someone, uh, to offer that person hospitality, uh, to kind of open a relationship or at least continue a good relationship. And so uh, when Jesus is talking about, you know, this old law of, you know, people striking you on the cheek, it's not necessarily that you're in a fight, right? Uh, that's what we think first. But it could be that the reason you got hit is because you were trying to offer hospitality and welcome. You weren't necessarily trying to be in a fight. Uh, but when you did offer hospitality and welcome, all of a sudden, people took advantage of that and used the chance to injure you. Okay, so then what? Uh, you could respond like the law said, and then in anger strike back the same amount they struck you. Or you could continue to offer welcome and hospitality and greeting. And so you say, all right, well, I'm going to still be that way toward you. It's not in the context of a fight. It's in the context of I want to keep or establish this relationship with you. So that, to me, put a different spin on it. Because at first I thought it seems a little bit odd that, that Jesus would open up his followers to abuse on purpose. And I thought, how strange is it to turn the other cheek right when you get hit? That just seems foolish. I mean, besides taking bravery and all that, this seems foolish. Why would you encourage abuse? But if you look at it with this perspective of you're offering your cheek to offer hospitality and welcome and, and form relationship, then that's a whole different feel. Then you're not seeking abuse. You're still seeking to have a relationship. And that's exactly what God and Jesus have done with us. Even after we have struck them on the cheek, they continue to offer the relationship and say, you're still welcome. And I'm willing to be hurt because it's worth it to me to have a relationship with you. That makes a lot more sense uh, in this context of turning the other cheek and the, the reasons that we're doing it. All right, so then you go on uh, to Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. So let's go back to that. 521 through verse 26. And this is more where it's talking about anger and then moves on into discussing forgiveness. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, uh, or fool, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Now, if you look at this, and again, break it down a little bit, especially the first part when it's talking about uh, anger uh, with your brother. Um, at first, I used to think that this was kind of an escalating situation. You start small with the smaller insults, then you get worse and worse until you finally get to the worst of all with the worst punishment. But I think actually Jesus is, I mean, there may be an element of that, but I think even more so, Jesus is talking about two kinds of consequences for our anger or lack of a good relationship with brothers or sisters. 
uh, because it seems to be talking about some legal consequences and yet also spiritual consequences. And so uh, when he says, if you kill, you're subject to judgment, uh, that's more of a human legal thing where there will be legal consequences in the community or in the court where you're at. Where you're at. Uh, it says, but if you're angry, you'll be subject to judgment uh, and because it's kind of more the seed of murder. And so it's judgment, more of a spiritual consequence, more of a long lasting thing uh, than just an anger. And obviously murder is more serious than anger. It says, if you say Raka, you're answer answerable to the Sanhedrin. And that's more of a legal consequence, an established body like that the Jews had. And if you say you fool, you're in danger of the fire of hell. And that's more of a spiritual consequence. And so I think Jesus is saying, look, when you get angry, you're not just worried about insulting someone and maybe getting away with it legally. Uh, even if you got away with it legally, which you probably won't. But even if you did, there would still be spiritual consequences that you have to deal with. And so again, Jesus is not only talking about the external, what comes out of your mouth, but also what's happening in your heart to produce that. Uh, and that's more of a spiritual consequence. Just a little background here, when it talks about um, the, the fires of hell, the word here in Greek, I believe is Gehenna. And that comes from Hinnom, uh, which is the Hinnom Valley. This is a, a view of modern day Jerusalem. Uh, and you see up here where the gold dome is, that's the Temple Mount. On the eastern side, you see the Kidron Valley, and it runs all the way down and joins up with the Hinnom Valley, which runs all the way around the southern part of the city of Jerusalem. And we know for a fact that during a part of its history, uh, Jerusalem had this valley as kind of a, a trash or refuge center, and, and often they would burn trash, and so there'd be smoke and fire down there. We also know this area was a place where some of the evil kings of Judah would sacrifice their children, uh, to the gods, to the false gods like Molech. Manasseh was one king that did that as well. And so uh, the, Jesus knew that visually the people uh, understood about the fires of Gehenna because they had seen this happen uh, for years in their history. And so again, it's just a, a visual concrete way to talk about a spiritual reality. So if you move on around uh, here again, uh, you see the Hinnom Valley. Oops, sorry. Hinnom Valley right here. Uh, and then if you look back uh, a little bit closer, uh, actually today the Hinnom Valley is more of a park. <laughs> they actually even have concerts here and it's a lot more beautiful than it was back in those days as well. So uh, Jesus uh, talks about uh, resolving conflict biblically. Uh, and I wanna emphasize that uh, out of the many things in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, some seem so hard to do and some, even when you do them, don't seem like they give results. Uh, it just seems like you wasted your time or your effort or suffered needlessly. Uh, but this one principle of forgiveness and going to your brother or sister and working it out, I want to affirm to you this works. It's not only right, but it's functional. It, it really is practical in terms of how you get along with people of all kinds, your, your families, your friends, uh, strangers that you don't even know, people in the community that you may have conflicts with. Uh, this principle works with them. And there are basically uh, three different passages, these three right here, uh, that are mentioned in this immediate context of Matthew. Uh, the, we already read the one that talks about uh, when you're angry with your brother or sister, uh, and, and so you're, they have something against you that you're supposed to go to them and resolve it. And in that case, uh, they are angry with you. Uh, in Matthew 6, if we jump over to Matthew 6, we have part of the Lord's Prayer where it says, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Okay, and so again, they're sinning against you, but the need to forgive is still there. And then if you go to Matthew chapter 18, uh, we see a little bit more complete treatment of the whole idea, uh, beginning in verse 15. Matthew 18, 15, and following. And Jesus says, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their faults just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, 
Treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And, and he was being generous. Usually we would get angry with people and stop forgiving after two or three. And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Or in other versions, it says 490, 70 times seven. So he tells a story uh, to drive home this last point. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Same words. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And that's uh, a lifetime sentence. He couldn't pay it back. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Now, what I want you to do is to maybe go back over these passages. And if you're with someone else watching this video or maybe a group, uh, take a minute to pause the video and to look through these passages in detail and see what important principles you find in, in terms of dealing with forgiveness uh, and anger you know, with other people. If you want to uh, go ahead and look at other passages in the Bible that also deal with it, you can bring in those principles as well, but particularly these. And as you do it, I want you to answer these questions. Uh, what do you think is the most important teaching about forgiveness in these passages. In other words, your mind, what's uh, the key teaching or what really works for you? What have you found to be really useful? Uh, number two, why don't people forgive sometimes? And think about that. That's a little bit more uncomfortable because uh, we tend to make excuses not to forgive. And sometimes we don't want to be real honest about the excuses we use to not forgive. Uh, and then number three, what are the consequences of not forgiving? In other words, if you didn't, then according to the Bible and according to your practical experience, what happens to you or within you or to other people with those relationships? And also, what are the consequences of forgiving? What happens if you obey? Uh, then what? Okay, so I want you to think about all of those. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, come, back, come back, take it off pause. And we'll continue on uh, as we went. Okay, I hope you had a good discussion there. Uh, I know that there's a lot to say, and maybe that in itself could take a half hour <laughs> or more. Uh, but it's one of the things that it's, it's good to be honest about. Uh, and remember, this really works. Now, if I could go back, I want to focus on one process, as we already read, uh, and then just several points about these passages uh, that we've read. Uh, and the process is what we read in Matthew 18 about um, how we resolve conflict. It's pretty well known. So the first few steps uh, I think we, we know and we try to do. Uh, the first step, you go to the other person. Um, and if that doesn't work, then you take one or two other people with you. Uh, step three, if that doesn't even work, then take it to the church. And to take a little pause here, uh, the church, uh, you know, at the time that Jesus says this, doesn't exist as such, right? This is Matthew 18, 
and the church isn't really born officially until Acts 2, right? But I think Jesus is anticipating the church, and he's kind of treating the synagogue and the, the Jewish community, the people of God, as kind of a called-out gathering like the church is, okay? And so this step is not necessarily take it to everyone in the whole community uh, that could form the synagogue or the church, but probably most likely take it to the leaders of the church, because with some conflicts that may be very embarrassing or only deal with two or three people, it's not beneficial to anyone to take it to the whole church and, and splatter it all over the church. Uh, it's actually wiser uh, and easier to fix uh, if you just keep it within a really smaller group. The idea is you're gradually increasing the circles of people that are involved in trying to resolve this in order to do it as well and as quickly as possible. So uh, that takes us uh, to step three. And then it says, if that doesn't work, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And we know how unpopular those were back in those times. And so I remember thinking as we went through this process before uh, that, you know, once you got to step four, then all bets were off. It was kind of fair game. You could treat this guy or this girl however you wanted to because you were done with them. Uh, they had missed all of their chances. They were stubborn. They were rebellious. They weren't even acting like a brother or sister anymore. And so you could do or say anything you wanted to. They were kind of outside the ropes. And yet a friend of mine said one time, says, okay, well, Steve, you know, think back. How did Jesus treat pagans or tax collectors? And it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> he treated them with love and compassion, and he forgave them, and he welcomed them. And the, the whole idea of treating as a pagan or a tax collector means they're not acting like a believer. They're not acting like a child of the kingdom. And so you still need to treat them with love and compassion and forgiveness and bring them back into the kingdom. It's not open season. <laughs> it's that you still need to act like Jesus would toward them. And, and that makes a lot more sense. And I understood it immediately. I guess part of me didn't like it very much. I kind of wanted to be able to say, okay, I'm done with you. And yet God never says that to people. <laughs> he always wants people to come back and never gives up. Uh, now, uh, I want to add... Uh, a couple of things here, and this is not in Matthew 18, but I think it fits with the spirit of Matthew 18, and it's a wise thing to do. I, I would put on number five in this process after uh, you've gone through the first four and assuming that it works and that you reconcile with the other person and you forgive each other. In my experience, I've found that often when you get to that point, you're so relieved and so happy and grateful that it's been worked out that what you tend to do is say, I'm sorry, and you're forgiven, and you hug each other, then you go away, and you're relieved and happy, and yet what you don't do is find a way to avoid that in the future, and so I would put number five, create a new plan uh, to avoid the same argument in the future, uh, so that you're not having the same fight twice or five times, that you can say, okay, what was it that triggered that? Uh, was it an event? Was it an attitude? And how can we avoid that in the future so that you never have to go through this again on this particular issue? And if you do that, I think you'll find it saves a lot of time and saves a lot of wear and tear on relationships. Because if you do the same thing again to the same person the second time or the third time, forgiveness gets a lot harder. Even though Jesus says 70 times 7 or 77 times, it's really hard to do it. It's better just to avoid it if you can in the future. And then, of course, all of this, and in a sense, this is number six, and in a sense, this applies to all five, but try to do all of this with an humble and kind attitude, where you go and you seek peace, and you say, I'm doing this because I value the relationship that we have, not because I'm trying to be right. I just want to restore this. I'm not going to try to win. I'm not going to justify myself. You're important to me, and I want to restore our relationship, and so I'm going to be humble and kind about it. And, and it's pretty much across the board. If you can do that with people, I would say 97% of the time, there will be reconciliation and forgiveness. And it's such a relief. <laughs> it makes things so much better, so much healthier uh, mentally and spiritually and physically even uh, for you to live in peace and have a way to resolve problems when they come up. Now, there's some interesting points here uh, out of this as we finish this, this first part 
uh, first of all, uh, notice that in every one of these examples that Jesus gave, it's always our responsibility to go and seek forgiveness or seek resolution. Even if it's not our fault, even if the other person wronged us, I would think that if, if they started it, then they should come. And that's kind of how we feel. But Jesus says, even when you remember that, uh, you know, your brother uh, has something against you or you have something against your brother, it doesn't matter. Jesus says, you go, leave your gift, do whatever you need to, but you go and make it right. Uh, the second thing is that other conditions about how things are working out uh, are not a reason to not forgive. Okay, let me repeat that. Other conditions of other kinds don't give us a reason not to forgive. For example, uh, the other person has a terrible attitude. They're still haughty. They're prideful. Uh, they're angry. Uh, they're, they're vengeful. That's not a reason for us uh, to not go and seek forgiveness or seek reconciliation. Also, if the other person asks forgiveness or not is not a reason not to go. It doesn't matter. Uh, maybe they don't want to forgive. Maybe they will never ask forgiveness, but it still remains with us to forgive and to seek reconciliation. Uh, also, it doesn't matter who is right or who is to blame. It doesn't enter in. We still have to go and initiate the process. And it certainly doesn't depend on our feelings, our emotions. If I want to do this or if I feel like I should do this, uh, that doesn't really enter in because often, we won't feel like it and we won't want to, and we won't feel like we should do it because we're thinking it's their fault. It's their turn. Now, Jesus actually makes this a command. He doesn't say if you feel like it or if, you know, it's, you know, been your fault. Now he says, do it no matter what. It's not optional. Now, this is a command. And in fact, the last verse of Matthew 18 says, listen, this is how God is going to treat you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. It's not optional. And then as Jesus says in Matthew 5, uh, you can be jailed if you don't resolve it. Now, sometimes it could actually be jailed physically uh, if it has to do with the legal matter. But even more easily and more importantly, even if you don't go to a physical jail, you are in spiritual jail. Uh, you are bound, you are limited, you're restricted uh, if you do not forgive other people uh, or if you don't seek forgiveness from them. Uh, that is a spiritual prison that some people live in their whole lives, and they don't have to. Uh, they can get out as soon as possible. Um, and so uh, think about this. This is so important to God that he says, look, I want you to forget everything else until you are reconciled to your brother or sister. Leave that gift at the altar. Don't let any time go by. Normally, we'd say, well, I'll think about it. And then I might do it tomorrow or next week or the next time I see him. God says, no, you know, take care of it right now. He says, I don't want your gift, your offering, your offering. Uh, it doesn't matter about fasting or about all the other. I want you to go and reconcile first uh, with your brother and sister. Peace is the offering that God wants. And then we see in Matthew 18, it says, you know, in the same passage where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am with him. And I don't think it means about you have to have at least two or three people to have a worship service. <laughs> That's good. But, you know, God can be with someone even if they're by themselves. God will be present with Christians. But this is in the context of getting along and reconciling. I think the teaching of Jesus there is, look, there needs to be unity. Two or three need to be together, unified, reconciled. And then Jesus' presence can be powerfully among them. It's difficult for Jesus' presence to be there powerfully if there's division and anger and lack of forgiveness. So some important things uh, about forgiveness and how we handle anger uh, and then reconciliation. So I want you to think about that. And the next class, uh, the second half of this class, we want to talk about different tools that might be useful to us from other fields of study. We'll see you next time.